Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be back in here. Thank God we're, you know, we're good to go. So we'll start with uh, a recap of last year. Do you have last year's numbers? Right? Yes, we did or no? I'm throwing you a curve. <laughs> I might. Actually, you did the presentation Monday night. Monday night. I do not. So I don't know if you, if you have that or not. You do, you do, uh, not get I don't have it uh, really available, but I can, I can get it. Off the top of your head, there was a 10% reduction. Uh, off the top of my head, our um, part overall part one crimes, uh, there was a reduction by, uh, I believe, 17% from last year. Our total clearance rates for last year for part one's crimes were 51%, which is, um, as I said Monday night, uh, is, is pretty, um, significant. pretty significant compared to the national average of 31%. So uh, the men and women in Deltona are doing a pretty dang good job uh, clearing cases. So, and with that being said, for those of you in the public um, listening, uh, as we go through the crime notes, we'll, we'll talk about clearance rates. Um, we'll talk about CBA, that means cleared by arrest. So if we have a case, um, we cleared by arrest or we clear it exceptional. Uh, cleared by exception means that um, we have identified a suspect in the case and the victim no longer wants to pursue criminal charges. So those are the two ways we can uh, clear a case. So. All right. Well, I said that. All right. So, uh, uh, first five weeks of the year in Deltona. All right. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Captain Kyle McDaniel. I'm the commander of District 4, which is the city of Deltona, the unincorporated areas of Osteen, Enterprise, and MEMS. So, all right. So, sorry, I got my, uh, my sheets a little backwards here. So if you look at um, the comparisons um, from last year to this year, our total burglaries are down 17%, our total larcenies are up 13%, our total car breaks are up 44%, but if uh, you'll you'll learn here shortly that most of those are gonna be CBA'd um, due to the hard work of our detectives in uh, Deltona. Our ag assaults are up 73%, the clearance rate on those are, are very high. Our total uh, domestic batteries are up 80%, percent our total part one crimes are up 14 percent we'll go ahead and get into our clearance rates for 2022 during this comstat period our clearance rates for burglaries are up 20 percent our total larcenies clearance rate is 31 percent our total robberies 50 percent our total ag assaults and batteries clearance rate is 84 percent and our total sex bats clearance rate is 400 percent and the reason for the 400 percent is um, most of these investigations take a long time they take months and months and months so we're clearing cases from last year so that we get credit for this year but we get credit for this this year so um, Ms. Vasquez uh, we spoke earlier about um, you know your concerns Monday night about the low clearance rates for sexual batteries and I explained to you that as months go on our clearance rates will go up and this is uh, proven that within the first five months of this year we have a 400 percent clearance rate so uh, we'll get into uh, Deltona traffic unit, our traffic stats for the first five weeks of, of this year. Our total felony arrest for the unit is five. They had 11 misdemeanor arrests. They, they worked eight, 81 traffic crashes. They issued 258 citations, 43 and 43 warnings. With that being said, the rest of the district wrote um, 207 citations, so uh, they're doing well. And we'll, with that, we'll get into... Well, we had a bit, before we get into the numbers, we had a really good night last night. Your crime suppression team picked off a guy wanted for uh, sex offenses against a 12-year-old. That is. And our homicide suspect from uh, the Bowery yesterday got snatched up by CST as well. So, uh, 
Yeah, so our crime suppression team uh, is, is made up of uh, one sergeant and five, I would say, highly skilled uh, deputies. Um, they are tasked with dealing with the worst of the worst that come to the city of Deltona. Um, within the first five uh, weeks of this year, they've been tasked with uh, apprehending several high-profile sexual battery suspects, um, including the one from Enterprise Osteen, um, where a transient last year uh, uh, sexually battered a 12-year-old runaway from Bunch. Uh, they had a, um, a, a lot of uh, input in dealing with that for the last uh, year or two. And if, uh, Captain Dietrich, if you want to go any in the depth on that at all, that investigation. Um, well, I'll, I'll just, yeah, yeah, after the uh, forensic analysis of the FDLE uh, sexual assault kit, obviously we identified a suspect in that. Um, our victim in that case was from the Mad this one, as Captain McDaniel said. Um, uh, that individual has, has a history of running away, which is, uh, I know, the, the reason um, probably not getting some of the resources that uh, that, that individual, that juvenile, needed to get. Um, she ran away when this incident happened. Uh, she did again uh, less than two weeks later, where she was trying to swim across Lake Monroe, and she was rescued. Uh, and then another time, she actually ran away, where she made it with a fellow partner. She made uh, a fellow runaway. You know, she made it out to the state of Illinois. Um, so obviously, uh, the sheriff recognizes that the juveniles in this county uh, need additional services and uh, assistance, which is why I know he is uh, very, uh, very hot to try and uh, looking forward to his juvenile assessment center that uh, he was trying to do. She's also, she, I don't know if you said it, she's trying to swim across, swim across Lake Monroe. Yeah, she literally uh, got recovered by Sanford PD. So uh, amazingly, uh, she made it across that lake. Carly, you want to talk about what we're, where we're headed with this thing? Um, we're going to um, open up a juvenile assessment center slash family resource center. And in the family resource centers, we will have service providers from Stuart Marchman, Halifax Behavioral Services, DCF, Volusia County School Board, and they will be there to meet the family's needs that are in crisis. And then it'll be a 24-7 operation for all kids that are picked up by law enforcement to be assessed um, as well with substance abuse, mental health screenings, to see what services we could start providing to the families on the front end in hopes of reducing some of the criminal activity that we've seen. Um, you will hear in this report there's quite a few first-time offenders that have never been arrested before, but they're um, doing felony crime. You want to you uh, touch base on the pilot program we have with DCF? Yes. Um, in September, we started a pilot program with DCF for mental health cases to reduce Baker Act. And as of February 1st, we touched 89 different kids and provided services to them and their families to hopefully reduce Baker Racks, find out what the triggers are, and give them alternatives to Baker Rack. You want to talk a little bit about the pattern we've so far this seen this year with kids, no criminal histories who are involved in arson? Yes. Um, since um, January, we've seen a pattern of kids throughout Volusia County with arson, and arson is a first-degree felony, and this is these kids' first-time arrest. We had a youth and um, a group in Deltona. They set a fire to a pipe. The pipe was inside the ground. They didn't realize that that was plastic, and that cost $8,000 worth of damage. Um, South Daytona had a kid who's never been arrested. He set a house on fire. We have somebody that's doing arsons at the park in the land. They haven't been identified, but from what we're being told, it's juveniles. And then this past weekend, um, three juveniles out of Orange City was playing with paper. It got out of control, and it blew up an electrical box in Orange City. So we don't know if it's a fad, if it's a trend. We're trying to you know, follow social media to see if this is something. But this is highly unusual for kids who've never been arrested. And we're talking 13, 14, and 15 year olds. We're not talking 16 and 17 year olds. We're talking young kids. We're talking you know, middle school kids with first degree felonies. All right, Kyle. Jump into it, Captain. All right, we'll get into crime. Uh, the first arson uh, Ms. Carla just spoke about that was cleared by arrest. Uh, we'll get into our auto 
thefts. Uh, during the fi first five weeks of this year, we had eight auto thefts. I think it's important to uh, note that six of that eight were unlocked vehicles with the keys in the ignition. The other two auto thefts were known suspects um, who had access to the keys. With that being said, we had the first auto theft, 2660 Delaware Street, Deltona, unknown person stole the victim's white 2019 Jeep from the driveway overnight. The vehicle was left unlocked with the keys in the ignition. It hit an LPR on the 27th of January. Um, it was later located via the Sirius XM uh, radio uh, in the 2800 block of Fox Chapel Court, and it's active to detectives. Good morning. This is assigned to Detective McIntosh. Um, no video, no witnesses on the original theft. One latent print that was recovered was of no value, and we're still working with uh, the Sirius Tracking Company to see if we can develop any historical tracking data from the. Can, I, I was fascinated by that. So can you tell people who have Sirius XM radio how you track your car? Should it stolen? Yeah. So a lot of so it works similar to OnStar, where they have internal tracking, and as long as you sign up and register for the service, and I believe most of it is app driven, so you can just do it from your cell phone. If anything like this happens, then it's a key for us to be able to find the vehicle within a short amount of time versus it sitting outstanding for a couple of weeks. We find it abandoned and we have no leads to follow up on. So very important for our part of the investigation. It's really good for those of us over 55 who park in Walmart or Publix and you can't find your thing. You need to find the car park. <laughs> That's why I was thrilled with that. I don't have any time to come out. Where the hell I park? And I'm, we're good to go now. Go ahead. Next auto theft, Maytown Road, Maytown Spur Road. Uh, the victim's trailer she was pulling got a flat tire. The trailer contained her 2016 Polaris UTV. She left the trailer with the UTV overnight. When she returned, both were missing. Um, no evidence, and this is active to the east side. Auto theft 151 Low Water Street in Deltona. The victim's son, Donald Travis, stole her 2020 Dodge Journey. Um, we've made multiple attempts uh, to contact the suspect. The vehicle is still outstanding. The suspect is still outstanding. We'll uh, complete a affidavit and file if we cannot find, find him. The uh, son is 14 and 6 on felonies and 24 and 8 on misdemeanors. Next auto theft, 990 Winbrook Drive. The victim left his vehicle unlocked with the keys in the ignition. His 2015 white GMC Yukon was stolen from his driveway. There is no video surveillance, and this is active to detectives. This one's assigned to Detective Goggin. We recovered the vehicle in Stanford, uh, processed it, received some latent fingerprints, and we're just awaiting the results of that. Okay. Next auto theft, 29 at 24 West Elton Street in Deltona. The victim, again, left their vehicle unlocked with the keys in the ignition. Their 2021 Chevy Equinox was stolen from their driveway overnight. The vehicle was uh, located via the OnStar tracking in Daytona on Ridgewood. Daytona Beach PD responded. There was no evidence collected, uh, no further leads. It's an activated by patrol. Next auto theft, 668 Vicksburg Street in Deltona. The victim reported her daughter stole her rental car a month ago and then refuses to return it. Uh, per mom, as of several days ago, she has no further leads, no contact with the daughter, and the vehicle is still outstanding. An affidavit will be completed for the, the daughter. She has no criminal history. Next auto theft, 2796 West Covington Drive. The victim reported his 2020 white Toyota Avalon was stolen from his front yard. The vehicle was left unlocked with the keys in the vehicle. Uh, neighborhood campus uh, produced surveillance video of two males um, stealing the vehicle. This is still active to patrol. 
Next auto theft, 550 North State Road 415. The victim's unoperable 2001 gold Chevy van was stolen from his front yard. There has uh, been no LPR hits. An NC4 bulletin has been created. We have no leads as of the 10th of January. It's been inactivated. Go ahead and get into uh, burglaries uh, business. During this concept period, we had three. The first one is of um, 2838 Hallam Boulevard. An employee deactivated cameras um, during their early morning hours and stole $52 out of the register. This is active to detectives. Uh, this is assigned to Detective Lacates, known suspect, to use keys to access the facility. It's an isolated incident. Um, Fifty-two dollars was stolen. Uh, currently, we're just going through the uh, DVR before the camera was deactivated to develop uh, some probable cause for arrest. Next burglary business, 1381 Hallam Boulevard. This is a storeway self-storage unit. Um, there's an extended time lapse. The victim believes um, $3,000 worth of collectibles were removed from her storage unit. There is no evidence of forced entry. We believe this to be a civil matter between her and her ex-husband who share the uh, storage unit. We've un been un unable to contact the ex-husband at this time. It's still active to patrol. Next business burglary was CBA, which was cleared by arrest. The next business, uh, we'll go into our burglary residence. I looked up, it was Heritage Middle School burglary where the student caused $20,000 worth of damage to the school. Yeah, so uh, three juveniles were able to um, gain access to a portable um, and they caused $20,000 worth of damage. Um, all three juveniles were arrested. Uh, none of the three had criminal histories. And Ms. Carla, do you want to touch on that? or? It was actually um, two portables that went in, spray painted it, and it, um, the damage did come in surprisingly at $17,000. So it's, I mean, this is during school hours, so I mean, kids, you know, they're sneaking out of class, cutting classes, and just getting into mischief on school grounds. We, we saw a trend in uh, the last part of the year, the November, December of last year. A lot of these kids were getting caught either vandalizing things or breaking into cars, and that common response was always, I was just bored. So I have to, um, have to figure out something for these kids to do. Next burglary residence, uh, 1043 Abigail Drive in Daltona. Two juveniles were home alone when they reported their front door was kicked in. Um, nothing else taken. Um, the nearby surveillance footage was located and depicted two unidentifiable subjects riding their bicycles. Uh, deputies were able to contact several uh, juveniles in the area who have a history of riding bikes and causing uh, causing chaos. Uh, Ms. Scholar, do you want to touch on these two? Yes. Um, the, the next night, there were several juveniles out on a bicycle, again, just raising havoc, kicking people's doors, and running just because they have nothing to do. But we can't link them to this first house, but they did do some other houses the second night. We'll go over larcenies of note. Uh, the first one, page five, uh, larceny 2067 Saxon Boulevard. Um, the victim went out to his work truck and noticed it was extremely loud. Upon inspection of the vehicle, he noticed a Calic converter was missing. Uh, surveillance in the area was captured and it depicted two white males uh, pretty much stealing the, the Calic converter. I'll let CID touch on this. This is a, a trend throughout the, uh, not only Volusia, but the state and the country. This case is assigned to uh, Detective Medina. We recovered the initial video on scene. Uh, we were able to identify a tag on the vehicle, put out a bulletin. Five nights later, one of the watch commanders was riding around in the uh, north part of the land, located the van driving around, at which time they fled. Um, patrol was able to stop stick the vehicle, and the driver was apprehended uh, with the help of a canine. The male subject, Rolando Vasquez, 120 of 88. He's got a criminal history of 29 felonies with five convictions, uh, and he's 12 and one on misdemeanors. Also in the vehicle was a female, Kendra Scott. 
Um, she has a, a criminal history, 6 and 0 on felonies, 9 and 0 on misdemeanors. Um, upon inventorying the vehicle, detectives located uh, the catal several catalytic converters, sawzalls, batteries, those, those types of things. What we didn't know at the time was that they had just committed another burglary in uh, Lake County, and the victim had observed it on video surveillance, tried to intervene. The van rammed the victim's vehicle and was able to escape prior to our uh, watch commander uh, contact. Um, once we started doing interviews, we identified a third suspect, a uh, Jason Berry, he's an Orange City Deltona resident. He's got a criminal history of four and one on felonies and seven and one on misdemeanors. Um, so far, we've linked them to, I believe, four throughout, three or four throughout the Central Florida area, and we're also looking into a few more in Seminole County and uh, waiting on a call back from Flagler County to see if they're going to be involved in those as well. It was interesting that this guy turns out to be shot after we fight him. Yeah, so he's sitting in the hospital and they're scanning his leg because of the canine bite, and uh, they find a bullet in his leg. Refuses to cooperate, tell us how it got there, and we still have no idea how this happened. I would venture to say it occurred when he was trying to commit a burglary in Lake County, probably in Umatilla, and uh, <laughs> just didn't report it. <laughs> yeah, you know, and then this one, I mean, we grabbed these guys, and then we had the one, I think it was last week or 10 days ago, where a guy was asleep in the car with a catalytic converter in the back. Somebody gets familiar with that one? With, uh, I think it was Missing Ed. And his partner gets the guy on Old Daytona Road, I think it was. Uh, it was yes. That was one day. They stopped them. Uh, they stopped the vehicle over in uh, actually the, uh, the Daytona area. Mm -hmm. They stopped it up there. Found the guy in the car. They ended up having some uh, uh, catalytic converters that were clearly recently cut off, as well as uh, some other property, like tree uh, trimming equipment and things like that. And uh, they did openly admit that they did steal the property. Uh, they were still working to develop where it was stolen out of the land, but they ultimately were arrested after the profession. And the hard part is no, nobody's telling us where they're selling these goddamn things. It's the, it's the big thing. Right. And, and it just it trends up and down so much based on the uh, value of the precious metal inside. So we'll see an uptick in catalytic converter thefts that'll last for a month or two, and then it dies off for six to eight months, and then it just keeps going back up and down in cycles. Okay. All right. Uh, that'll take us to the bottom of page 12, the last, next larceny of note, 2779 North Juliet Drive. Uh, the victim believes a suspect st stole nearly $16,000 from a safe. Uh, the victim was reported as a missing juvenile. Latent prints were recovered from the safe and it's active to detectives. This was assigned to Detective McCray. Uh, the juvenile had no criminal history at the time. What we determined was over a few month period, she had stolen about $15,000 from her grandmother just by accessing the safe um, frequently. We ultimately arrested her on that, tried to track down some of the money. Um, I think we recovered two or $3,000 that was given to a friend of hers, mother, um, who had knowledge of where the money came from. So ultimately we also arrested her um, on some charges as well. All right. Uh, that'll bring us to page 14 with our larceny car brakes. Back up for one second and yes, talk sir. about the, the kid who stole the computer from Deltona Middle. Um, Mother Corbis. Oh, uh, yes. No, go ahead, please. Okay, uh, so we had uh, the mother of a juvenile uh, noticed a bunch of computers at her house. Um, it turns out that she contacted us and the computers were stolen. So we responded and uh, deputies and detectives were able to recover, I think, all but maybe one of the computers. The reason why he stole the computers is because it was um, um, winter break and he wanted to be able to communicate with his girlfriend. So that's why he took the computers. Well, thank God for mom. That's all I can yeah. say. Yes, thank you. Good mom picking up the phone. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, that'll uh, take us into our larceny car break. Good. Larceny car breaks, page 14. Uh, there we had an uptick in our larceny car breaks. Uh, we had 13 during the first five weeks. I think all 13 were unlocked vehicles. Um, but after before you go through the, 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 my question for you guys is you had two the, the stolen car thing you had two stolen cars at a 49 zone where both were unlocked to keep access to keys and we have video of some kids on bicycles going by 
And now when you go in here, when we go through this, you're going to see we have multiple arrests. Is there any way, anything that could tie into that 49 trend? We, we've looked at a few. Um, there's nothing definitive that we've been able to say, hey, this kid is definitely related to this. We have our suspicions that they obviously trend together. Typically, when we see an uptick in car breaks in an area, we'll also see auto thefts where juveniles will go out, break into a bunch of cars. As soon as they find car keys, they steal the car and they're done for the night. Um, but at this time, we have been able to make them to it. And you'll hear a common word, and if you haven't already picked up on it, uh, surveillance, technology, an overwhelming majority of our crimes are solved um, by the technology we have and then the technology that the community has invested in, cameras, uh, ring cameras. So if it wasn't for the community, uh, we wouldn't have the numbers that we have today. So. We did the uh, car breaks, the first two we had in 42 zone, Eagle's Nest and Deltona Boulevard are both related. Um, the victim reported a $400 Echo backpack blower was stolen from his open lawn trailer. Uh, both are active to detectives. These are assigned to, uh, there's gonna be five total cases, um, including these two, assigned to Detective McCray and Detective LeCates. Um, through pawn data records, we located Daniel Larson, uh, 822 of 93, no criminal history uh, as a primary suspect. We were able to close two of the cases, 1778 and 1881, for a stolen chainsaw and several stolen guitars. Um, pretty much when we arrested him the other day, his story is that he just got evicted with his girlfriend, uh, developed a very quick heroin habit, and so to support, to support that habit, he's been going around stealing anything, particularly targeting uh, landscape trailers, open landscape trailers where people hang their uh, backpack blowers and stuff like that on. People aren't securing them properly. He's just walking up, pulling them off with a rubber piece and it's gone. So he's been arrested on two of the five and we're still linking the next three based on the bonds too. Okay. Next Larson car break, uh, 2728 Sweet Spring Street in Daltona. The victim reported her unlocked car was entered. Her purse containing debit cards and other miscellaneous items were stolen. There was no evidence collected due to the rain. Um, neighborhood canvas yields negative results. NC4 bulletin was created. It's active to detectives. So signed to Detective McIntosh. No witnesses, no physical evidence. Um, through bank records, we know the card was used at a local gas station, but declined, and we're just waiting on the final uh, hourly schedule when it was declined to be able to pull video surveillance. Um, we captured the video during that time frame, but in order to narrow it down, we're going to have to wait for the statements to come back. Okay. Next large scene, car break 2542 Sable Avenue. The victim reported his unlocked vehicle was burglarized overnight. A backpack containing multiple items was stolen from the vehicle. Uh, however, the backpack was found in the neighbor's yard. Um, we spoke to the victim on the 4th of this month. He has no further leads. We have no evidence. The case has been inactivated by patrol. Next larceny car break, 1586 O'Hare Street in Deltona. The victim reported between January 16th and the 18th, unknown subjects entered his unlocked vehicle, stole $2,000 in cash and business credit cards. He reported the several fraudulent transactions on the business credit card, totaling $336. It's active to detectives. This one's assigned to Detective McCray. Uh, the card was used at Publix on LCAM. We obtained video surveillance, identified one of the males. Um, we're trying to collect one more piece of video surveillance, and we're going to scoop him up for an interview. Is he a Deltona resident? He is, yes. <clears throat> Next larceny car break, uh, 27, 274 uh, Council Bluffs Drive in Deltona. This was cleared by exception. The victim's daughter broke into the car. She no longer wants to pursue criminal charges. That'll take us into our next car break trend in 46 zone. Um, the next uh, three entries um, are all, all related and they're all active to detectives. You guys pull up the uh, Travion Stevens uh, PowerPoint, please. <clears throat> so this, uh, like the captain said, being one of our burglary or car break crime trends this period, um, we had three in this specific area. This is the uh, Southern uh, and Cortland corridor down there. Um, one on Highland, one on Cloudcroft, and one on 
shallow bird. Uh, during this investigation, uh, we recovered video surveillance. Um, Travion Stevens is a known thief. Uh, he's got a criminal history of 18 and three on felonies and one and one on misdemeanors. We were able to, detectives were able to readily identify him based on the video surveillance. Um, additionally, we found a backpack that he was wearing during one of the videos that was later found behind a separate party's house. In the backpack was his identification card, um, several other items, and a handgun. Uh, him being a convicted felon, we obtained arrest warrants for uh, several counts of armed burglary, theft, and possession of firearm by felon. Uh, he's a suspect in several other cases. Currently, he's, uh, we believe he's out of the county, but we're still working on tracking him down. Gotta love when they pose on social media with a gun. Makes it easy. It does. Okay. All right. We'll go into our next uh, larceny car break, 1520 Agatha Drive in Deltona. The victim hired a cleaning service on the 21st um, and noticed that the uh, suspect had spent an extended period of time in the garage. She became suspicious. When the cleaning lady left, she checked her car and noticed multiple items missing from the trunk of her vehicle. This case is active to detectives. This one was assigned to Detective Gates. Um, we weren't able to track any of the items down. There's no physical evidence, no video, no witnesses. Uh, we conducted an interview with S1 and ruled her out. This case has been suspended. Her victim was born in 1921 on this case, right? Yeah, elderly female. Although we have had countywide, we have three main cases this period where somebody had cleaning first, you know, you know, cleaned out the board, they cleaned, they cleaned out the house. Uh, that'll take us to the uh, top of page 18, our uh, final crime trend for the car breaks. The next five are all related in our 42 zone area, and they're all active to detectives. Yes, pull up the other uh, crime trend for this period. Uh, this is going to be involving uh, Austin Dinger as a juvenile um, car break extraordinaire at this point. Between the last reporting period and this reporting period, we had nine all in the Edgewater condo areas in Deltona. Um, all of them were unlocked doors with the exception of one, uh, I believe it was a convertible that the top was cut. Um, miscellaneous items stolen, a handgun being the most, most notable. Um, during the initial crime, the uh, patrol sergeant responded to the scene, observed him inside of the vehicle. He fled. The next night, he was contacted as a suspicious person in the area. We were able to show the uh, patrol sergeant pictures of him, immediately identified him. Um, we contacted him at school, arrested him. We currently have cleared five of the nine cases. Um, and a little bit more work to do on the last four to see if we can directly link him to them. But since his arrest, all the uh, car breaks in that area have stopped. Again, this is the first time uh, arrest for this juvenile who's never been arrested before. Yep. No criminal history. All right. And I think uh, we have the uh, community manager, Rachel, in the building for the Edgewater condos. So, Hi. hey, Rachel. <laughs> Rachel, anything you want to jump in on and add on? What's that? Is anything you want to add on or talk about? Um, we, we did. Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's dad. 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 You better follow your dad. You <laughs> um, we, we put out little life signs, you know, telling people, like, don't be a big, because most of the cars were unlocked, except for that one that complained. But um, we did, a couple of times, people reported our security guards because they walked through the so I got them jackets that say security and stuff like that. But um, I was talking to him yesterday about a little, some extra patrols because once it started, they, they came back like two or three times and it was just like four nights in a row that cars got broken into. And then we had a couple of uh, convertibles that were slashed. So once they find out that it's dark in there and that they can't, the cars are open, it just seems like they're coming back. So I would definitely like to see some officers patrol in the area. I mean, it's one perimeter just goes around the whole entire thing. So they just pulled in off of Providence, Joe Schrager, you come out on Lakeshore, and that's it. So I think it would deter a lot, especially with the kids in the area. If they saw a, a patrol car. You got it. So, thank you. You got it. We're on it. 
Thanks, Rachel. That'll take us into our armed robbery at 2675 Arcadia Street in Deltona. The victim invited a known suspect over his house after approximately 10 minutes of physical altercation ensued. Um, the victim's uh, Glock pistol was taken from him. He was beaten with a wrench. The suspect uh, stole a backpack and fled the scene. This is active to detectives. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, this is assigned to Detectives Medina and Baird. This was closed with an arrest. The victim was targeted after flashing his cash, just trying to be popular. The suspect known, he's Jaheim Burton. Uh, he is quasi-homeless, been living out of his car. He is uh, 10 and 8 on felonies, 9 and 6 on misdemeanors. And after committing the robbery, fled down south. Um, we were able to locate him in Lauderdale Lakes in Broward County. Uh, where he was taken into custody without incident with the assistance of local jurisdiction down there. Uh, we sent detectives down there to Broward County and recovered additional evidence to some of the cash that was um, spent, and uh, we're just waiting now for him to get extra guys back up to Coolidge uh, County. Good job. Great. Good job. Uh, that'll take us into our aggravated batteries. We were three for four uh, clearance with our aggravator battery. Our uh, outstanding uh, aggravated battery was 2337 Lake Helen Osteen Road. Um, the victim reported being shot by an unknown person while standing in his driveway of his residence. The victim suffered a through and through gunshot wound to his left kneecap. Uh, this is active to detectives. Uh, this is assigned to Detective Ray. The, the circumstances around this is definitely suspect. Initially, it was very uncooperative, the victim and the, uh, the, the quote-unquote witnesses that were on scene. Um, later identified a person of interest, Jeremiah Fuller. He's 14-0 uh, and and, on felonies and 6-5 and five on misdemeanors. And um, it's still suspect on how we got this name, so right now we're just working on uh, gathering additional evidence to see if we can move forward with something. Okay. Thank you. And that will take us to our domestic violence. We were 27 out of 28 with arrest. Uh, one was a warrant walked for the month, uh, the first five weeks of the month. What was that number again? Uh, 27 out of 28 with yeah. one warrant walked. So that'll bring us into our frauds. Um, I'm not going to go into each individual fraud, but I will go over a broad um, view of what we're seeing in not only the city of Deltona, but in the county as a whole. Um, Detective Almazi has some literature. I think he put it over by the coffee. Please feel free to grab some of the fraud literature, read it over. Um, what we're seeing is a lot of phone scams, um, and it's not even necessarily our elderly community. A lot of these people are in their 40s, 50s. Um, and they're getting contacted by anywhere from the power company to airline companies um, and saying that they owe them money and they go and get gift cards, uh, which cannot be tracked. And uh, they're getting uh, taken for hundreds and hundreds of dollars, sometimes even thousands of dollars. Uh, Julian, if you want to touch base, touch on any of this, uh, please jump in. Uh, send a microphone down, I'm so. Like Kevin McDaniel said, uh, the, the scams are always going to change. Uh, one thing is going to remain constant, that if someone asks for payment for, uh, with a gift card, it's, it's a scam. There is no commercial use for, for gift cards. Gift cards are for gifts only. Uh, you want to give your grandson a $100 gift card uh, for Christmas or for a birthday. That's what gift cards are designed for. No legitimate company will call you and ask for payment with a gift card. When you hear that, you hang up the phone and block the number. It's, it's a scam. Uh, this is the trend right now. That is a quick way for the scammers to get paid. No matter what the scam is, if somebody asks for a gift card as a form of payment, it is a scam. So please remember that. And I brought some literature there. Please take one and share it with your family and friends. Uh, we'll be more than happy to, to give fraud presentations to any, any city that 
they would like us to. Um, any HOA, anybody? Any HOA, anybody. I'm, I'm more than more than happy to do it uh, after hours on weekends. Uh, I rather do that than have to track these gift cards. And these scammers are are very crafty. A lot of them don't even live in the country. They're overseas. And we hit a dead end when we identified that they are in India or Pakistan and there's nothing we can do. Uh, a lot of the gift cards are being used to purchase cryptocurrency, which is the new trend right now. And that's even worse as far as tracking it. So it's very simple. You hear a gift card as a form of payment, it's a scam. It's as simple as that. And we can reduce scams, but at least 50% by just doing that. And you guys had another word, but it's at nine this month, which is kind of number one on the high side. Ten. Ten. You got it too? Did you really? You didn't send any money? No. No, okay. Yeah, we, did you, we're only the ones that we, I'm only by the ones that are reported to us, so I don't know who realized that they got scammed later, so I'm not calling the cops up to a virus to do that. I was with you. Sometimes they do show up. We've, we've had that. The last scam was they were sending Uber drivers to your house. That was around Christmas time. They were telling you, you know, your grandson was arrested. He need ten thousand dollars in bail money, and they would go get the ten thousand dollars in cash, and an Uber driver would come and pick up the money. And now we followed one of the Uber drivers all the way over to Tampa before somebody was watching him and got slick, and they didn't make the pickup. But we've done other times where we have tracked it down to South Florida or other places where it tracked. So, they're, but this is all they do. So if they make a thousand calls a day and one person bites and they get ten thousand dollars or five or whatever it is, it's their, you know they made their day's wages. So, thank you, Julian. Thanks, Julian. The, um, I'm sorry. The request uh, for a demo at the uh, HOA. Did we go through Captain? Yeah, just like this year, just like Captain Daniel said, we got we got a group that wants to have a board presentation. In. Julian will definitely go out there and put everything out there. Rachel wants to be the person. You got it. Just give us give us uh, the date and time, and we'll, and we'll be out there. I'm tired of our president calling and saying, one more, just give me a final gift card. What do I do? No, hang up. Hang up. Chair, can I address something? Jump in there, sure. Uh, as Sergeant Jula uh, Imazi said, these change, um, and they pretty much have a script, and as you talk about, they will tell you they're going to meet you, but when it comes time to meet, they won't show up. They'll call you and say, I can't. I mean, because they're, they're smart enough. They're telling you they're going to meet you to sell you into the scam. So you're like, oh, okay, this is legit. The same way nobody from the sheriff's office is going to call you and say, your child's in an accident or your child's been arrested, you need to send us money. If you ever get any types of calls like that, you need to hang up the phone and then actually call the sheriff's office with the number that you're familiar with. Um, as well as with Amazon, um, people call and talk about your computer's been bought, you know, has a virus, you need to give us your password. And then they will actually remotely access. No computer company is going to do that. But when they access your computer and you have all your passwords saved, now they have everything to get into. So that, that is not legitimate. Whenever you get those types of calls, um, if you feel the, they're very convincing when they call, I mean, it, unfortunately, it's, they, they are very convincing. Uh, if you get calls about your credit cards being compromised, hang up the phone. And if you feel that it was legitimate, then call the number on the back. That's the individuals you need to talk to, and then you can say uh, another common one is your Amazon. You know, somebody's ordered an Apple iPhone on your Amazon account for a thousand dollars. It's uh, you need to call us. That's a scam as well. So. Front, Frontier Airlines was it? We just had that one. Frontier Airlines. Yeah, the first one. class. Back in West Point. Yeah, he's a Air scam. Sheriff's office is collecting money. That's a scam. Victim of, uh, we came home. Someone had ordered a box, like eight grand worth of iPhones. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ac 
accessed his ID somehow, and we had a box of iPhones that was delivered to our house that we didn't order, brand new iPhones. And my concern is with the elderly or other population, because if that's getting delivered to a resident, then you can make sure that somebody's probably wanting to come get those, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So I, I was, our household was a victim of that. I don't know if you've heard of that. You've heard, I've heard other people saying they got stuff. So if that's something going on, I'm sure you're aware of it, but I just want our residents to be aware of that also. There's all kinds of scams going on. Again, just pick up the phone, call us, and we'll, we'll follow from there. Scams change. Things are remain constant. They've got to get paid for And the mechanism behind that is you think about when you order stuff, you can track it on your phone. So when these individuals order stuff, they know, all right, here's a window that's going to be delivered at this house that's not connected because that's how they hide. And then they'll wait for the truck to pull up. So on those particular instances, give us a call. If a package like that arrives at your house, you pick up the phone and say, I, I just got this package or, you know, eight thousand dollars worth of iPhones. I didn't order this. Yeah. Um, as well as, as I just mentioned, Captain Westfall. All of our names and pictures are on our website. So that's how people get our names, and they use the sheriff's office to call and say, you know, to where you may say, you know, you may get a call, Captain and Daniel. Hey, we're, I'm here to collect money. It's they're able to get that from the internet, and then they use that. So just so you know, the city of Ormond Beach was hacked recently. So. They have official emails that they're sending us soliciting money. Because all of us are on the police chief association, so they're slick enough to realize all the emails coming from was Jesse, who's the president of the police Black chief association. So they're sending you, hey, so and so is retiring, and you know you need to do A, B, C, D, F, and G. And when you first look at it, it's a legitimate email. It's coming from Jesse Godfrey saying, here's what we're doing for the chief that's retiring from Port Orange. The problem is the chief from Port Orange retired like in March of last year. And now I'm getting an email telling me, hey, I need to see collect the gift, so you, you know. And the same thing happened with Oak Hill. Uh, the vice mayor was sending, and it was last Christmas, they're getting emails from her saying, hey, you know, we're at a country, it's my grandson's Christmas, is there any way you can get a gift card? And so they're really making sense up on any of your name saying the same thing. And you look at it, it's like, oh, yeah, but then you got to you know, take a step back. In the build of that one, when they use our names, uh, there's, there's ways they can spoof the number. So the number you'll get will be and look like a number from the sheriff's office, seven three six five nine six one. And anybody in this room who's dealt with the sheriff or called the sheriff's office, hey, that's the sheriff's office number. But they they bounce them and they have fake numbers. So the number you see is not the number you they're calling from. So if you were to hang up and call that number, you would get our office. The, the number that you're showing in your ID may show it's us, but it's not us. So that's another way to do it. Kyle? I have nothing else for the city. Uh, I want to thank the commissioners, uh, Commissioner King, um, Cool, Vasquez, and I see the mayor hiding in the back. Thank you for taking time out of your day. And, and John for buying breakfast. And Mr. Peters, thank you. <laughs> thank you, John. Norris, you guys want to talk about much what's going on, not only what we're seeing in Deltona, but what we're seeing countywide is, uh, Facility we just yeah, we just had a storage facility yesterday. Um, I know 
I'm the drug dealer from the Tonin Bear area. He's up there, his son, he's got his son in the business now. The control doesn't stop. They get in the car, they find a stolen gun in the car. Obviously, some, I believe it was cannabis. He uh, was leaving the storage shed. They run the dog on the storage shed. It hits. They get 137,000 currency, uh, large scales with cannabis residue and cocaine residue. Here, that he's probably packaging stuff and sending it out for the reason for the high uh, amount of money. Uh, this, this, this. How, how many um, have you done in California? Search warrants? Uh, well, out of last month, I believe four search warrants were in California. And then the rest were uh, the land or the west side of the county and the east side. Do you find that uh, Deltona is slowing down a bit? There's connectivity to all this stuff. Because I think what we said earlier was you serve a search warrant in the land that has a nexus to Deltona, that has a nexus to New Smyrna Beach. So it's all interconnected into what's going on. You, know, you have certain people that are here dealing alone, but there's a much bigger, that's what these guys look at. Basically, and another thing, yesterday we stopped a dealer. I know this dealer. We tried to stop him. He ran from us. He's a DeBerry boy. He got stopped yesterday. Had about, I think, 500 grams of cannabis on him. Two guns, one stolen. And But he's over, lives in DeBerry, comes over here, deals his stuff, goes back. The one girl that we uh, dealt with in Deltona, servicing New Summer Beach in Deltona, but getting her supplier was the land. So all four units work together so that they can you target and identify this one, if it branches out, you work together to get the supplier of that one. I know we were having an issue on Enterprise, um, the Tona Enterprise, which will have a large um, homeless problem. Is that under control now? Yeah, our CST team went in there. Um, most of it uh, has been moved on. Uh, a lot of them were panhandling um, with the help of the city and the um, the panhandling, yes ma'am, when the panhandling ordinance, um, we were able to move them out of the city um, based solely on they can't panhandle. So they're gonna go somewhere where they can panhandle and they can live. Um, they can't do it in the city. Right, and I know that um, it was brought to my attention that now it's happening over by the Edgewood Condo area. Panhandling? So okay. Mostly, um, mostly park. Um, what park? Thorny. Thorny. It could be um, an isolated area in Thorny Park, even though the city cleared out, and so you can see it, so it's slowed down, but it's... We got a springtime park out ah, countywide coming up, so we'll just throw that on the list where we go in there, look and see, put other cover for people in there and see what's going on. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Can we talk about, um, I'm just this ledger is very um, lying to me up here, um, as far as a domestic assault and domestic violence here in Deltona. This is disturbing to me, um, the numbers. We have more than one happening a day. I'm needing to understand what resources or what is happening at these domestic assaults and batteries uh, as far as any, um, you know, recommendations, as far as any help. What's going on? Or can you tell me about the footprint of what that looks like? Is there? I know that we, Captain Marino, and I talked about this coming up. I'm trying to understand the footprint of domestic violence in our town, drug and alcohol related, mental health related. What that looks like because we don't quantify, we can't solve the root cause, right? So can you, someone, speak to me about that? What you're seeing in the field going into these domestic violence situations? Go ahead. Um, well, first of all, I, under, I, I share your concerns with domestic violence. However, I don't see an earth-shattering um, issue in the city of Deltona with 100,000 residents, um, probably at this point even more, um, 28 domestic violence cases in five weeks with 100,000 residents. Um, I don't, I don't see something that is earth shattering, but I agree domestic violence is an issue. Um, I, we spoke about this the other night. Um, what? Good, I was gonna just read this synopsis and I, and I don't know how you battle with this one. V1 and D1 became engaged in a verbal altercation over infidelity. V1 and D1 were involved over an argument about him leaving the house with the car keys. She grabbed them by, he grabbed her by the arm and punched her in the face, creating a mile, uh, minor cut to the top of his head. 
What's that? She punched him. She punched him. <laughs> That's the same thing with the infidelity one. Uh, this one has a prior conviction for domestic violence. The above subjects have been drinking alcoholic beverages in the morning. This is 11 o'clock in the morning. An argument ensued over infidelity in the marriage, and the defendant became enraged and pushed and slapped the victim in the face. Uh, B, D1 and V1, uh, D1 and V2 are involved in a, in a romantic relationship and reside together as a family unit. A verbal argument erupted over how to discipline their son. The incident escalated to the physical level where D1 threw the cell phone and struck V1 in the head. Uh, D1 and V1 live as a family unit, mother and daughter. D1, who is born in 1992, shoved her mother, who was born in 1963. Then you have the young man, who was 12, who pulled a knife on his mother because his mother punished him for playing hooky from school. It's the second time he's done that. The last time he tried to choke her last month because she tried to take his cell phone away. Uh, so they're just a synopsis of some of the things that went on. Verbal argument was escalated into D1 grabbing V1 by the neck. Uh, D1 and V1 are married, involved over a verbal argument over marital issues, it turned physical, and D1 struck V1 with a cell phone, which is a common yeah. weapon. Okay, I, I get that footprint domestic situation. Is there any, like, just referrals? Is there a resource given at the scene, or is that out? So our victim advocates contact all these victims, they offer them services, they offer, they offer them placement if needed, um, they offer them means to escape the situation. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for that, because I've had people reach out to ask me that. You know, with Delta and Strong, we've done that quite a bit, help women or family members escape from domestic situations. So I just um, I just wanted to follow up on that. Absolutely. It's not like probably earth shattering in the scope of 100,000 you know this, the Absolutely. person affected. It's, it's each really person's crisis. I understand so, that. So and you know we are probably one of the only organizations that makes warrantless arrests that we're allowed to. Yeah. So every time we get a domestic call that comes in, the men and women in Deltona automatically, they take the report and then they go out and look for the aggressor. We don't go and get warrants. Right. We do it because it can make a warrantless arrest. When we get a warrant, and after three or four days go by and we can't find a person, then we get the warrant so that the case can be, you know, if the guy's somewhere else or the girl's somewhere else, we can grab it. So that's why we have such a high incident for arrests. You know, 28 cases, we make 27 arrests. Some other jurisdictions don't do that. They wait for warrants to come through. We have zero tolerance for that. And of course, I can't tell you, Chief will tell you, how many of them don't come to court, how many of them don't participate in anything, and how many of them are repeat the method violence. And that's the ones you want to try to break that cycle because they live there, they refuse to, to cooperate. And they end up, they end up dead or severely injured. Thank you. For that. Thank you all for what you did. No, I just want to uh, echo what the sheriff just said, and that's where our victim advocate program comes into play. I mean, they are familiar with repeat offenders, but we can't make somebody do something that they don't want to do. They provide them the resources uh, and the avenues to seek help because there are county assets within the Volusia County that uh, there's a beacon center and there's a bar. There's a variety of things that our victim advocates bring to the attention of these victims, but again, just providing that information is the extent of what we're able to do because if they don't want to help themselves uh, or they're in a situation, I mean, they drop the charges, they don't testify, or they, you know, they have a different mindset the next day. There's nothing else that we're able to do from our agency standpoint. And sadly, the residual of this is the kids in the house. Yep. Because the kids see it. And it becomes acceptable. Yeah. I would offer you to come out to all these commissioners, come out and have a cup of coffee with our victims' advocates and uh, get to know and see all the stuff that they do for, for our community. Do we have lit do we have literature? Does anyone know this? Do we have literature here at City Hall regarding resources like that? I know that we have resource literature, but do we have that specific resource, domestic violence, that kind of thing here at City Hall? Is it possible that we get that uh, on we'll approval of the city got. manager here? Yeah, we'll send it up there. We'll send it up to the gym. Okay, because I know that people come from here quite often, and, and it would be great to have those resources. Absolutely. Any type of resource literature like that, um, because I'm reached out to quite often about these issues. 
I would suggest posting it on your website as well. Hard copies and it posted on your website. Uh, Lou, you want to go over real quick, in 2018, we retooled, we repolicy, we got more or less lethal weaponry out on the street. It showed the last five years, I don't think they had that slide. But, uh, you have that slide, that you answer. Just show the dramatic decrease, especially uh, less injuries to deputies, less injuries. To yeah, we, we're um, so we've been tracking use of force incidents, and actually last year we took it even a step further, kind of to go along the lines of what the uh, commissioner was mentioning about those, those uh, uh, more intricate details. So not only have we uh, continued to track our use of force, but we also track our uh, use of force as far as show of force is concerned. So the difference between use of force and show of force basically is uh, you may show some type of a weapon, an inter intermediate weapon, but not utilize it. And then, of course, if you take action with that weapon, uh, that would be an actual use of force. So we're now tracking both of those, not just the use of force. So look at the, the, the numbers are pretty staggering as far as once we started implementing the escalation uh, style training, we started utilizing technology to our advantage, uh, purchasing additional uh, forms of technology to help us affect our, our, our jobs. Um, the, the main crux of this, honestly, has got to be uh, de-escalation. So de-escalation, in a nutshell, it's the utilization of time, distance, and, and, uh, and shielding. In other words, slowing down the situation so that uh, cooler heads can prevail. Obviously, there are instances where we just have to react. But the, the incident last year involving the, uh, the two juveniles over there from the pump uh, facility, that's an example of you know, us utilizing our technology, our resources, slowing things down. Unfortunately, it ended the way it, it ended, but they just simply left us with no other alternative. But those are examples of de-escalation. So from 2017, just deadly force incidents, uh, we had in 2017, six, 2018, four, 2019, two, 2023, and last year we had four. That's a decrease over the years of a 33.3% decrease uh, in deadly force incidents. Um, and all four last year, we have been fired upon. Yes, all four last year, we were engaged upon first, and so we reacted that way. Uh, less lethal force incidents, these are um, incidents utilizing less than lethal force. We had 116 in 2017, compared to last year in 2021, we had 50. That's a 56.9, about 57% decrease uh, over the, the course of the past five years. And then total use of force incidents overall, 122 in 2017. Last year we had 54. That's a 56% uh, decrease. Um, vehicle pursuits, uh, we had five in 2017, four last year, decrease of 20%. And then our show of force. So as far as a show of force is concerned, um, the total show of force that we had last year was 714 incidents where we just showed that force, but it didn't rise to the level where we had to utilize the force. So like, uh, for example, maybe we drew our taser, uh, we warned them, hey, you're gonna get tased, and then they de-escalated, they started complying with our commands, and then we can go in and affect the arrest. So. And the reason that is a part of a study that if with taser, that showing the taser, does it gain compliance? Right. As if, you know, how many times you actually use it, how many times you actually show it, and they gain compliance by using it. And sometimes they, they spark it, and the person's like, I, 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 I give up, I, I'm done, you got it. Yeah, it just shows, uh, you know, and, and justifies, helps to show how effective those tools are. You know, the assumption is, but well, we have those tools, you know, once, they, once we draw it, we're gonna use it. That's just not the case. Those tools can be effective. Uh, just by displaying them. So we wanted to start tracking that last year. That's what we're doing. So we'll start to uh, we'll start to see how effective those tools are uh, just from the display uh, aspect. Of it. That's really all I got overall. Anybody have any questions or comments? We got you covered. Okay. We got you. We got you. Well, we appreciate you guys coming out and uh, allowing us to use the. City Hall. John, thank you for the hospitality. Welcome to the uh, night. Appreciate you coming. I think I, I shoot and everything y'all do. I, I think I shoot for all of us that uh, the men and women that are assigned here want to be here. That's the most important thing. And there are some of them in this room that were here as deputies, were here as detectives, got promoted to sergeant, wanted to come back, got promoted to captain, asked to come back. I think that says a lot for working in this community. People come through here as their career progresses. They want to 
about it. Don't know. So, thank you all. That's because we give you free coffee. And that, 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 that is true. I mean, you know, Maritz, you're giving cops donuts. I mean, you know, I'm trying to keep these guys in shape. So, and we'll take care of your dad. Uh, this gentleman's dad turns 99. Oh, wow. They've been a resident here since 1976. 1976. Wow. So, we're going to get some uh, stuff out there in this, in this house on Saturday. So, thank you all very much. Have a great morning. Good luck here.